anywhere. You've been sitting in your room for a while now, I think, on our live streams. And uh, it's really a great privilege to have you here with us again. And I know I'm excited and the team were quite excited before you joined. And uh, most of you know Ajahn Brahm, but I'm going to just read a little there, uh, the latest bio that I created for our new leaflet. So here it says, Ajahn Brahm is a renowned and beloved meditation master and author of many best-selling books. Trained in, Ch in Thailand with Ajahn Chah, he's been a monk for over 45 years. Ajahn Brahm is spiritual director of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, an advisor to numerous Buddhist groups, including our Anukampur Bhikkhuni project. He courageously pioneered the revival of Bhikkhuni ordination in the Theravada tradition, that's the full ordination for women, and is passionate about creating opportunities for all people to experience the liberating power of the Buddhist teachings. Despite his huge responsibilities, Ajahn teaches tirelessly and his humorous, insightful talks save many lives. <laughs> and he also asked me to add a little bit more onto the bio. So again, this is my disclaimer. I've been asked to do this and to explain why Ajahn Brahm's other name is Ajahn Donut. Does anyone know? <laughs> so I didn't I say that. Are you gonna give the answer? Do you wanna give the no. answer? No, 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 come on. Oh, come on. Okay, so uh, the reason that Ajahn Brahm's other name is Ajahn Donut is because what size is a donut? What shape is it? It's round and quite plump on the outside and sweet. <laughs> That's why we called it Hard Questions from a Soft Teacher because Ajahn Brahm's very sweet, even if he's being asked very challenging questions. So do try your best. And the other reason is because most most donuts have a hole in the middle. <laughs> so there we go. He's empty and very holy. <laughs> so introducing Ajahn Donut to lead the session. Thank you very much. Excellent. So shall I begin now? Very good. So welcome everybody to this evening. As usual, I start with a little talk for maybe 15, 20 minutes before we start the uh, questions. I do always prefer the questions because that means that you uh, drive the, the session rather than myself. And so very often you give so many, 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 many talks uh, online or here personally in our centers, but all of those talks uh, they are talking about how to get to understand one's mind. Now the body we pretty much know, but how to understand the mind and how to make it very peaceful, very calm. And with that peaceful and calm mind, we get what um, somebody said uh, in a BBC article, which I read, we can get enhanced perception. And this is something which I've been on about for many, many years that very often that people practice mindfulness, but it's ordinary mindfulness. It's a mindfulness which may get a little bit more powerful, but doesn't get to the really oomphy mindfulness, which comes so when you do get your enhanced perception. And one of these uh, uh, hermits, they were staying over in Scotland. And that really uh, piqued my attention because I spent so much of my vacation periods when I was a student going up into Scotland and staying in his bodies, these little huts in remote parts of Scotland where you would just go and uh, you'd take your own stuff but there would be a roof over your head and a bit of solitude for you. Well, I love those little bodies and here they're still there which I was very happy to see and to see that this uh, one particular woman, she was spending so much time there as a hermit and because she was spending so much time as a hermit, one of the things which happened to her was she'd go outside in the morning and the wind was just so incredibly powerful, not, not strong, like very strong winds, but so powerful she could feel it so much more fully than usual. And when she said she had a simple uh, oat porridge in the morning, it tasted absolutely delicious, much better than you can get from the top restaurants. And everything she saw and she felt was like amplified, enhanced. 
And that is such a common phenomena when we become still. Our five hindrances, as they say in meditation, become subdued, which means our mind wakes up. And whatever we see, whatever we fear, whatever we hear, uh, really gets very, very strong. I do see a little question there, which is on the, the chat box, which I might as well answer because it fits in here. What is the mind and where is it located? Now, first of all, uh, where is the mind located? This was one of my friends at university that when he um, uh, got married and had his children, he told me this anecdote about his daughter in grade one, you know, the first year at school in UK, that she was asked a question by her teacher. The whole class was asked a question, which what is the biggest thing in the world? And if you've ever taught, you know, like grade ones, they are so enthusiastic. They all put their hand up and one of them said, Miss, 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 my daddy is the biggest thing in the world. No, 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 Miss, an elephant is the biggest thing in the world. No, no, Miss, a mountain is the biggest thing in the world. They were really getting their imagination going. But the daughter of, you know, one of my still best friends, and she put her hand up and said, my eye is the biggest thing in the world. And everybody stopped. They couldn't understand. What do you mean your eye is the biggest thing in the world? Well, this little five-year-old said, my eye can see her daddy. My eye can see an elephant. My eye can see a mountain and so much more. If all of that can fit into my eye, my eye must be the biggest thing in the world. And you can see by changing perspective, she had a wonderful answer. And so astounded was everybody that, you know, that when uh, I was told that by my friend, I said nine out of 10, but not 10 out of 10, because your mind can see everything uh, that your uh, mind can see. So your, Mind can see everything your eye can see, and you can imagine things you'll never see with your eyes. And your, uh, your mind can hear sounds, really imaginary, can feel sensations. It has its own bit of knowledge as well, its own area of mental phenomena. In fact, everything you can ever experience can fit into your mind, which shows that your mind is the biggest thing not the biggest thing in the world because the world can fit into your mind it's a different way of looking at things but it answers so many questions and it's it, it's uh, in in sync with the buddha's teachings the mind is the, the chief the forerunner of all things in the first verse of the dhammapada and so when we realize the mind is so huge that all your experience and phenomena can fit into it. We never again try to say, where is the mind located? Because the mind is not in space. Space is in the mind. It's a different way of looking. And I love those different ways of looking at life because those different ways of looking, which goes against what we've been taught, what we've been trained, what we expect, is how we get the great insights of life. We get this enhanced perception that there, when you've got nothing at all, this hermit living in a, such a simple place, you know, found that her porridge in the morning, it was just like a five course delicious breakfast made by some top class chef. And it was just ordinary. But her mind had enhanced perception. And it also brings to mind that little poem, which I was inspired by when I was a student, which I continue to, uh, to record and to tell people uh, from William Blake, to see a world in a grain of sand, see a heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand, an eternity in an hour. This is two hours, so this is double eternity <laughs> this session. <laughs> but you can see that that idea of your perception getting so strong to see a world in a grain of sand. You don't pass it over. It just draws you in. And what you see is beautiful. A wildflower, something so small, 
but there's a heaven in there. And then hold infinity in the palm of your hand. No boundaries at all. And eternity in an hour of time has no more meaning. And that's what happens when your perception gets really enhanced. Not through drugs, because you're not quite sure which way it's being enhanced, but just through the power of the mind in stillness allowing these five hindrances to get weaker and weaker and weaker. And so you can stay with whatever you're experiencing for longer and longer and longer. And then not only do you experience the mind for yourself, so you don't need to have it explained to you, what is this mind? You know it because you've seen it, you experience it. But also the happiness which comes from this, the joy. The joy which comes from the fact you're, uh, your hindrances are weakened, your mindfulness is incredibly strong, and what you tend to see is more beautiful than usual. And that is one of the experiences which you get you know, from being a monk for so many years or being a nun for so many years, practicing lots and lots of meditation. You can see deeper, see clearer. What you see is more joyful, more happy. And that's one of the great things which again people don't talk enough about in uh, Buddhist meditation you know that uh, you just need to see that or read that second sutta in the Diga Nikaya the Samanya Pala Sutta which the fruits of the holy life you might say the fruits of meditation when the king Ajatasattu first went to see the Buddha and said what are you doing this for why are you a nun why are you a monk? Why are you practicing you know, this path? You know, he said, you, you know, you are, came from a very good family. You could be able to be a great um, king yourself and have all these pleasures. Why are you doing this? And the Buddha replied, you know, king, you don't realize what pleasure really is. And he started talking about all the different levels of joy and happiness which you get from practicing this path. Simple things, like when you renounce a little, you get so much happiness back. Just you know, keeping precepts. As a young man, I never kept, well, I did keep a few precepts, but not them all. <laughs> and some of the things, you know, I used to go and get, go to the pub, get some alcohol, get drunk. Several times I did that as a student, it's almost what you're supposed to do. You never thought about it. Until the, somehow or other, when you meditated more, you started questioning what other people were doing. Go to the pub and get a pint. Why? And so when I questioned it, after a while, you sort of you gave it up. See what it's like if you don't have any alcohol. And I felt so much more power, clarity and happiness. Just the experience of like being honest and being trustworthy made my life just more peaceful and happy. And so much of everything which I did, when I was keeping my precepts, it got to the point that I used to go and hang out at the Thai temple in London. And I just recall quite clearly that one of the monks there said, you've been coming here long enough now. It's about time you took the five Buddhist precepts. And I asked the monk, I didn't know what the precepts were. What are they? He said, not killing, uh, not uh, committing adultery, no, not killing, not stealing, not lying. Uh, I missed one out there, committing adultery, not lying, not taking alcohol or drugs. And I told this monk, look, I don't need to, to resolve to keep those precepts. I've been keeping them for the last year or two. I was a vegetarian then. And I would always be honest, on the London buses, if they conducted dinner after my fare, I'd go out to him afterwards and I'd sort of give the fare to him. And that made me feel so much happier, which was weird. Until I read in the suttas, that's called the, uh, the blameless happiness. Uh, Abhayapachasukha. No, Anawajasukha, sorry, Anawajasukha. And you get happiness out of being a good person, being trustworthy. And that just starts the happiness and joy. You get just, uh, as you live a more simple life, you have more time, more peace, less things to worry about, and then you get even happier. And how much do you need to be happy? And then you have uh, 
that's uh, the restraining your senses and then you start to do some meditation and wow it really takes off and sometimes those deep meditations are more bliss than you can ever imagine and just to finish off this part of the just the introductory session the little talks i can keep going on for hours that there was one gentleman who came to stay at the monastery where i live and he was a heroin addict and he was doing his very very best to try and um, keep off that heroin and he came with his wife he asked please i'm not really a buddhist but can i stay here just to try and um cold turkey he said yes okay it's a it's a nice um, quiet supportive place there's no stress here and he was doing so well about almost two weeks i think he told me how difficult it was because he said maybe a thousand times a day you know he had to say no to keep off the addiction one time only one time he had to say yes one moment of weakness and he was back on the heroin again a terrible terrible addiction he was doing so well and i do recall him running after me one day when i was going into town to give a talk and say i never thought i would say this he said that the pleasure of meditation was better than heroin he said that was just i know there's of sexual pleasures but this was the pleasure of heroin which was apparently far far greater than sexual pleasures but the meditation was even more so and you know, he obviously had got into a very deep meditation because he really had to but unfortunately just one time he said yes to the heroin again it was too easy and so he took some more again and he eventually left a great shame but at least he knew this was i've never taken heroin but the joys of that um, deep meditation are immense and just to finish off before people ask me this question is people said well i are you going to get attached to that pleasure of meditation and that was a question which was answered in the Pasadika Sutta. I love quoting this one. And there the Buddha was uh, telling his disciples, look, if anyone asks that, are you attached to the pleasure of meditation? You should always tell them, yes, I am. <laughs> and they said, well, if you're attached to the pleasure of meditation, what happens? And the Buddha said, there's only four consequences, only four possibilities if you're attached to the pleasures of meditation and those four consequences are stream winning <laughs> once returning non-returning or full enlightenment that's what happens so that's a powerful teaching about the joys of this life the happy path oh it's so nice so there we go that's uh, a nice introduction for you so now we'll open for the interrogation otherwise known as questions and answers Great. thank you so much Ajahn. we have quite a few questions coming in so i've got about uh, yeah. three huge emails full of questions so um Good. we'll see how Got much there. we can get through so i'm going to start with juliet so she asks Please can Ajahn Brahm talk about living with chronic non-stop pain for years without getting stuck in aversion, Papancha? Yes, it's, it's a difficult thing to do, but remember that pain is of the body. And the Buddha always said there's two types of pain, physical pain and the mental pain, which is a reaction to it. And it might be a hard thing to say this to you, but it's true that the physical pain is a smaller part of that uh, reaction the mental pain is 80 90 percent how we reject that pain and i've had different pains in my own life and to be able to let it go is a wonderful thing to be able to see to experience for yourself but of course that we cannot measure our pain and compare it to somebody else's so i thought but there was one of the students over in Perth, in Western Australia, and he had such chronic back pain. 
and it was extreme. And he told me that they'd done some CT scans on his brain, which gave them an objective measure to inform his friends exactly what he was feeling. And he said that the uh, pain which he felt constantly was the same as a normal person having their arms cut off with a saw. Extreme pain. But what had happened to him was that you know, he could not escape from it with any drugs, even though he was one of the few people, he told me this time, the few people who were permitted by law to take any drug, any drug at all, you know, even sort of illegal drugs, whatever, but he was exempted because his pain was so extreme. But he said what really helped him was his meditation. And he said he could get into such deep meditation, even in the hospital, that, that was his way of training his mind to overcome that pain. And I remember him coming up to me one day and saying, a big smile on his face, I've finally done it. I've finally done it. I said, what have you done? And he said, have you got the ECG flat, which is now stopping your heartbeats in the deep meditation? He said, oh, no, I did that weeks ago. I got the EEG flat as well. So the brain was just so incredibly still. And this was, you know, uh, in the hospital. And he turned around with a big grin and said, see all those people in the back, which I'd never seen before in our temple. Those are doctors and nurses from, from the pain clinic trying to figure out what the heck is going on. And these are experiences which have been told to me by people I know are, are authentic experiences. So I'm saying there's a possibility there. It's a tough possibility, but sometimes it's the only way we have. Little by little, you see people with great chronic pain who learn how to live with that pain, to be with it, rather than be against it. It's who they are. And they open the door of their heart to those experiences. They don't try and escape from them. They find they're at peace with it. Weird, but it's true. Okay. There's another one about suffering and anxiety. So I'm going to put them together. One lady is asking about anxiety and how to work with that. And someone else is saying that they feel overwhelmed with all the suffering in the world and have been finding it difficult to take on any further problems from others. Could Ajahn Brahm please advise me of a meditation technique or anything else that may be able to help? Okay. <laughs> Remember, just uh, worrying about others, does that help them? Does that help you? And sometimes just learning how to be at peace inside. There's one person who is not suffering in this world, you. But when other people suffer and you're just another person to add to the list of people who are suffering, you're increasing the pain and problems in this world. So, there is many, many ways of learning how to let go of this world, just temporarily, enhance one's perceptions, and then see the meaning why there is suffering in this world. What's the purpose of it? Okay, you can say it in a very simple way, just, and I'm sure you've all heard this before, about the person going home treading the dog, dog poo, because oh, they're not allowed to say shit. Oop. <laughs> and they get it all over their, um, their shoes, but they mustn't scrape it off. They must take it home with them. And, and when you, only when you get home, dig it under the apple tree. And one year later, your apples will be as sweet as ever before. Suffering has a purpose. It's how we learn compassion. Many people can be, try and be compassionate, but they don't know really what they're talking about. If you've really been hungry, you can never pass by someone who is, needs some food. You know, if you've had your heart broken, you know the importance of things like forgiveness and love. If you've been in great pain, you know, you know what it feels like. And that en enhances your ability to care for others. So all the suffering in this world, there's a purpose behind it. 
it teaches us to grow. And when people don't heed that message, that's why the, the suffering in the world keeps growing more and more and more and more and more. But one thing in our modern world, especially with things like COVID, that sickness and death, we seem to think that when someone gets sick, that something's gone wrong. There's nothing wrong with being sick. It's part of our life. To the point that many of you have heard me say before, if any of you are listening to this, if you have some disease or some illness or some injury, and you go and see your doctor, your GP, never ever tell them, there's something wrong with me, doctor, I'm sick today. There's nothing wrong with being sick. You must always say, doctor, there's something right with me. I'm sick again. We're taking away the stigma of, of, sick, of sickness. but also taking away the stigma of death. Basically, nine years I was in Northeast Thailand and I never saw anybody cry at a funeral. And it was usually a funeral or a cremation once a, once a week, probably on average. So, and you saw those villages beforehand when their partner was sick or their kid was sick. You saw them just after the funeral service. And it really impressed me that grief was not part of their, their response to something as final as a death. They were at peace with it, at ease with it. Maybe it's because it was uh, in a village, in a farming community. Somehow or other, in places like, you know, a modern world, we've lost contact with what death is. To the point that we don't even say anyone dies, they just pass on. Or they've you know, gone to the other side, or they have all these ways of excusing. They've gone to a better place. <laughs> all these little excuses, and they're dead. This body has gone. And we're so attached and so fixed to a body, we don't remember the mind. Now, the person inside, if you like, now that's something totally different. And so, you know, that doesn't disappear that easy. So if a person really understands the nature of this mind, look, if you've got a car or a motorbike or even a bicycle and it wears out, you know, you just recycle it and get a new one. So when our body gets very, very old, why are we so afraid or so um, anxious when a person's going to get a new body soon? Oh, well done, grandma or mother. Your old body is just so hard to keep up. It must cause you a lot of pain. Now you can get a new one. Different way of looking at things. So this is how we get rid of anxiety, what we're really afraid of. Any time you are afraid, it's always afraid of losing something which you're attached to. If you're not attached to things, that fear disappears. There's no anxiety because you will lose it anyway. It's not mine. So your fear is overcome. You're quiet, can't hear you. You need to unmute yourself. Venerable, we can't hear you. That's Venerable Chanda. You're muted. Venerable Chanda, you are muted. You need to unmute. Hello. That's better. You can hear me again? Now, yes. Okay, my speaker sometimes goes out, it drops out. So please let me know if that happens again. I keep changing my speaker. Okay. Very good. So this question, apart from self-defense situations, is the use of violence ever justified to exert good change in the society from the Buddhist perspective? I say no. Good. <laughs> Very good. Okay. Can we go it's on to another question? Yeah, go on, yeah. 
Or did you want to I never seen violence work. So this one is about meditation. So in meditation, when a hindrance arises, is it always best to simply know what's occurring and let it run its course without getting involved? Or is there some time to apply input and do something about it? It's run its course. What is its course? If you see a hindrance, if you really see it, it usually stops pretty quickly. If you really see it. That is like the simile in the suttas taught by the Buddha, where if Mara comes, this uh, demon, devil, whatever you wish to call it, or the great bhikkhunis, like Venerable Chanda, or the great monks, <laughs> they would say, I know you, Mara. They just see, know exactly what's going on. And then Mara would leave straight away. The nun knows me. She knows me. And the Mara with shoulders drooping uh, would just go away. It's not through uh, willpower, but wisdom power that hindrances are overcome. You see them. You know them. And then they disappear. Sometimes kindness, but kindness is part of your life anyway. That's one of the reasons why that marvelous simile, which was told by the Buddha, I enhanced it, of the anger eating monster. If you have seen an anger eating monster who comes into your palace, you say, Welcome, monster, thank you for visiting me. Is there anything you need to eat or to drink? And in that story, which is in the, uh, I think the Yaka Samyutta somewhere. He's in the Samyutta Nikaya. Uh, there, the um, kindness shrinks that monster, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, until in the original story, the monster got so small that it vanished completely away, just through kindness, because it was called an anger eating monster. So, this is why. Uh, we have this uh, beautiful sense of even the most difficult problems in the world, be kind to them. And I just, one of the stories which come up, I was telling Ajahn Bhumadi about this a few days ago. Apparently I hadn't told him about it, it was amazing. That once when I was visiting um, the town of Bunbury, south of Perth, uh, to teach in a prison, in the evening, in the afternoon, I sat on the beach in Bumby. No one was there at all. It was quiet and I was just meditating quietly. And then I heard something whiz past my ear. And then I heard something else go past my head. And I realized somebody was throwing stones at me. And so I opened my eyes and another stone whizzed past me. And somebody was shouting out, they thought I was one of these followers of the, you know, the orange people, Rajneesh, who was uh, threatening to come and get a centre in Western Australia. And they shouted out, get off our beach, Rajneeshi. And I realised they were serious. The stones were getting closer. It was only a matter of time before one hit me. So I got up, turned around and walked towards them. Not running away but walking quietly towards my assailants. It was about, oh, maybe eight or nine sort of teenage boys. And because I wasn't showing any fear, they all ran away, <laughs> except for one. One stayed. And I went up to him and I just talked to him. Look, I'm not a Rajneesi. I'm just a nice, peaceful Buddhist monk. I'm coming here to teach some meditation in prison tonight. And you know, you, even if I was one of these Rajneeses, you shouldn't throw stones at anybody. And then they all came to see me and they all came to talk and you know, they said, sorry, we had a nice discussion about Buddhism. So you don't need to have worry about things and even violence. There's other ways of dealing with that. And you know, even in forests, there's so many animals who, not so much over here in Australia, the, Animals, there's some big snakes, but the big snakes, if you're kind to them, they will, you know, they'll respect you. And they'll leave you alone. Same in Thailand, the snakes over there, they'd crawl on you sometimes. 
they'd sort of uh, be in your hut. The tarantulas would fall on me in the hot season. Be always kind to everything. I respect everything and never do violence to things. And those animals would respect you. So anyway, that's my attitude to animals, but also to people as well. Even when I used to go inside the jails, there were some very, very rough people there. Who'd done, they've killed many human beings, murderers, rapists, thieves, very violent people in the jails. You go in there, you just, you're kind, you respect the people. There's another part to them, not just the violence. There's something else in there, and that's what you look at. And I felt so safe in those prisons. And the prisons would tell me, look, no one will touch you in here because they really like you. Because I respected them, and they respected me immensely. So this is what happens when you have a good heart. You don't need violence. You need kindness. And then you're not anxious at all, wherever you go in this world. Okay, we're going to invite somebody now who wants to ask the question personally. So um, for Karen, knowing that you'll be on the live stream, Karen, if that's okay with you, you can still change your mind. Can't see her. We'll be asking you to unmute, Karen. Karen Long. I, I am. Hi. <laughs> Good. Hi, I cannot hear you. Muted again, Karen. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. It's the earbuds. Earbuds. Okay, uh -huh. morning. Uh, question for you. Is there an external factor with causes and conditions, or is it just an internal factor of ego? Is there, could you repeat the question? I didn't really hear is, it properly. Is there an external factor with causes and conditions, or is it just an internal factor of ego? I don't really understand the question. External factor, the causes and conditions, do you mean just other people or other beings? Yes. Like as far as, is it just the, like the fabrication of ego that causes, causes and conditions in the world? Or is oh. there, is it an external factor that is a part of it? Or is it all just the fabrication of an ego? I think it's a, it's obviously a combination there. External factors as well as the way we, uh, color it in. As a child, I remember sometimes your mother would give you uh, coloring books, black lines on white papers, and you were supposed to, with colored crayons, to fill them in to make up uh, something which uh, was uh, representative, to, representative to you. And so sometimes you make a beautiful picture, but you could only sort of do the colors inside the the uh, space is delineated by the black lines. So you had limitations, but okay. that piece of paper, how you colored it in, you made it beautiful, you made it ugly, you made it scary, you made it loving. That was very much up to you. Okay. So very much your life and your situation is how you're going to color in this day which is in front of you. Are you going to give it lots and lots of forgiveness to the people who are really giving you a hard time? Are you going to spread some kindness and some peace in this world? Or do we color it in with black and grays mm -hmm. and sort of ugly colors or whatever it is? You know, it's up to you to make a beautiful color or make an ugly one. And black you. isn't ugly, black is beautiful. Thank you. That's a beautiful response. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And uh, now we're going to take a question for Mel. Thank you, Venerable. Hi, Hi Arjun Van. Uh, Hi. Apologies uh, in, for, uh, in advance if this is a difficult question. Um, the invitation was in the title, I think. So I, I'm yeah, going oh, to. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, dear Arjun Van, as an equalitarian, 
I believe strongly in equal rights for all and no one group yep. is superior to another. Yep. So when I heard Venerable Chanda's story about being made to stand at the back of the dinner queue behind, uh -huh. <laughs> behind the lowliest monk just because she was female, it made me feel very upset, very angry and disillusioned with the forest tradition. Arjun Brahm, you are a pioneer. So I ask you, when might we see an end to such discrimination in Bodhiyana Monastery and the line be according to seniority, no matter the sexual identity? Thank you. Uh, you will see that in one week's time. <gasps> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason, the reason I say that is because uh, one of the bhikkhunis, I don't think even Ben Chanda knows this yet, one of the bhikkhunis at Damasara Monastery, her mum was staying here and was quite sick. She had a problem with her eyes. And so that uh, this nun requested, can I please stay at Bodhinyan, oh, Ajana Grove Monastery, so I can look after my mum? I said, yeah, sure. And she's also uh, with her mum. Uh, her mum's gonna have a cataract operation. And so she's probably going to have to stay in this monastery for about three or four weeks. So she said, well, I might as well stay at the range retreat. And so, yeah, why not? So she's going to be here. And so now uh, she will have to be coming the arms round. So it's about time. I totally agree with you. There was a couple of monks who were just uh, not happy with this, but one monk is not here. And there's only one monk who's standing out, so I'm sure we can convince him that this is the right thing to do. Thank you, Arjun. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. So hopefully we can get some video or something so you can see. So anyway, the, sorry, Venerable Chanda, we didn't do that last year. But this year, it's time. Very good. Yeah. And may it be a long-lasting and sustainable change. <laughs> uh, once it starts, it's easy to keep up with that change. Okay. Thanks, Mel. And I have a question now about meta practice. So mm -hmm. this person was in my morning session and they were trying to learn to radiate meta and spread it in all directions. This person says, I feel like a little baby who's just started to walk, but is receiving instructions on how to dance beautifully. I can resonate That's with wonderful. Meta as non-ill will or non-hostility, but the rest is still very far away. I can try to feel mudita for the lucky ones who are already in that stage of radiating loving kindness, but it really looks and feels much further away from where I am now. How do I practice in order not to get discouraged? Oh, well, just how far you've got already is wonderful. So um, never look at the two fabrics in the wall. Otherwise, you'll never want to build a wall again. Look at the fact that you've got 998 good bricks in the wall. It's growing. It's wonderful. And little by little, you'll surprise yourself. I mean, this last year during the COVID-19 crisis, you know, we got, you know, as many monks as I possibly could who are staying with me here in Bodhinyana Monastery to get online and give talks. And people really appreciated it. But the thing which you didn't know, which we didn't tell people, was that many of those monks thought they couldn't do talks. And they were just blown away. They were so surprised that people actually liked what they said. So usually, your opinion of your own abilities is far less than the truth, the fact that you have great abilities. So, and I'm sure that even when we're chatting, if you experience that, you start to give talks and you think, oh, that's not such a good talk. And we say, no, it was wonderful. It's amazing. Well done. So it's one of my jobs is trying to remind people to keep on doing this and you get this amazing confidence. And the fact that when you really relax, you give amazing talks. And this is, well, I'm not trying to sort of blow my own trumpet, but sometimes when I'm giving a talk, I don't plan it. And sometimes I say something, I thought, wow, that was amazing what you just said. And I'm not doing this out of some ego trip, but it's just like surprise. Why wow, did I say that? 
And a lot of times that selfless thing about when you answer questions or you give talks. And this is one of the reasons why that uh, the person asking this question, you think you can't do meta. Yes, you can. To quote Barack Obama, yes, we can. <laughs> and you'll be surprised that how powerful it can be. And when you start to have that type of confidence, it's amazing how powerful it can be. And sometimes even little dogs, they can feel that you're a very kind person. Or little cats or other beings that can come to you. And uh, I must tell this story because this is a funny story. There was a gentleman, he spent one year with me in Perth as an anagarica and he went back to Germany to finish his education. And uh, he went on campus at one of the universities and the very first day on campus, he was having his lunch next to an ATM machine when the ATM, ATM machine made some sort of sound, he called it a gurgling sound. And he interpreted that as the ATM machine welcoming him onto campus. So every day he would spread loving kindness to a machine, an ATM machine. May you be happy and well, may you never run out of money, may people not shout and scream at you when they find they've got no money to draw out from their account. May you have a wonderful life, you ATM machine. He did that every day. And then one day he said he was having his lunch on the seat next to the ATM or close to the ATM. And he'd noticed that no one had been close to the ATM machine for about half an hour. And he heard this gurgling sound only the second time he'd heard this. And a 20 euro note came out of the machine. No one had put any credit card details or punched any, any notes or anything. It just 20 euros came out. And he was shocked. And he sort of took the 20 euros. He waved around. Does this belong to anybody? There's no one around. No one claimed it. So he realized this is the result of spreading loving kindness to ATM machines. <laughs> you get 20 euros. And I investigated that so many times. Look, please, you know, don't, don't lie to me. Don't sort of tell me things which weren't true. He said, Ajahn Brahm, I keep my precepts. You know me. I've been in your monastery for a year. That happened. That was real. So that's what you can try the next time with Meta. When you pass an ATM machine. Lovely ATM machine. <laughs> Maybe happy and well. I really need sort of, you know, 20 pounds sterling. Thank you, Ajahn. <laughs> we it's didn't include, stories, the, the I must admit, we didn't include ATMs this morning when we spread meta in all directions. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I've done that to machines before and it works. A car is, you know, can't start or there's something wrong with it. And the old um, machine I had, the old uh, cement mixer, which I had here when I was young and used to do much work. No one else could start it. You just stroke it a few times there, so then it's okay. And then you pull it and it starts first time. It's weird, but it's, it's true. Um, do we have time for one question before uh, we have a little meditation break? Yeah, sure. Great. So this question is on behalf of a lady's 11 year old daughter. Yeah. who she's been reading your stories to since she was little. So she told her last night that she's going to ask a few questions from Ajahn Brahm and her daughter said, please ask him for me whether it was my karma or whether it was just an accident when I slammed my thumb in the car door. Please can you answer this query? She's listening in with me. Yes, it's usually karma. In other words, that you were probably not careful enough when you actually entered the uh, the car. So if it was like, so it was not karma, <laughs> nothing to do with your car, <laughs> <laughs> but very much to do just with, so be a bit more careful, because it must have hurt terribly. So next time we learn when we're entering a car or we're uh, carrying anything, to be careful, make sure that you take your finger out before it slams. Because you've only got 10 fingers 
So, you know, you haven't got, you've got many more years, you've got to use those 10 fingers. And imagine what would happen when you go to school, if you had only nine fingers, you'd have no way to count them. You, you, you failed the mathematics tests. That's only a joke, by the way. <laughs> Very good. Since that was a, quite a fairly brief question, shall we do one more? Another five minute question? Yeah, go on. yeah sure. Great. So this one is about dependent origination. But first they say, um, Dearest Ajahn Brown, many thanks for all your teachings and for training so many amazingly wonderful bhikkhunis and bhikkhus. Yeah. Can you please help me understand the first four links of dependent origination? After the fourth, it's a bit easier. It is said that ignorance, avidya, is a, cho a condition for choices, sankhara, which are a condition for consciousness, vijnana, which is a condition for name and form, nama rupa, etc. Is it that somehow avidya is present and then it generates will, and then will somehow creates consciousness? How? Many thanks for showing us the way of peace and wisdom. Very easy. So instead of calling it ignorance, which is one of those old translations, which doesn't really just get what Awija truly is. Because you have what is the cause of Awija, what keeps it growing, and it's the five hindrances, is what is the food, the ahara, the sustenance of Awija. And so for me, I would prefer calling Awija, translating it as delusion. You might even say weak-mindedness, not seeing things properly. And in particular, not seeing that many of the things which we want are just going to make more suffering. That things we try and keep are just impermanent anyway. Let them go, for goodness sake. And not seeing the non-self. There's no one in here. So when you see there's no one in here, then of course the will, the choices disappear. And a simile, which is hard to explain these things, but over these years I've made up similes. And this simile is the simile of the driverless bus. So sometimes your life, you know, it's an old simile of being on a journey, a bus journey. And sometimes your life goes through some beautiful scenic um, territory. And you see the waterfalls and the grass and the mountains and everything looks just like heaven outside the bus. So you tell the bus driver, whose name is Will, you tell the bus driver, slow down, stop, park, I want to enjoy the happy times of my life as much as possible. But more often than not, your bus driver, the Will, speeds up and the happy times of your life don't last that long. And then, and then, you go through the toxic waste dumps of life, really difficult situations, very unhappy. And so you tell your bus driver, come on, get out of here as fast as we can. And what does your bus driver do? Slows down and stops. And all the difficult times of your life tend to last longer than they should be. You wanna get out of there faster. So it's because your will, is not very smart. And so many times people have a spiritual life, they want to just to train their will to be more wise and kind. But to be able to train your will, you've got to find your will first of all. Find this bus driver which is driving your life. And eventually you manage to get to the front of the bus, to the bus driver's seat. This is the path of meditation. We go deep inside and you actually see just you know, what makes you work. The source of this thing, which we call will, what actually is it? And then you get amazing insight, a great shocking insight. You find the bus driver's seat is empty. There is nobody driving your bus. And that is the Ouija, it sees what Sankara really is. And then, as a result of that, you go back to your seat, you sit down, and you stop complaining. All of this craving, ill will, stops. There's no bus driver in the seat. So they can see there that Awija, Pachiya, Sankara, it's that delusion, makes that will, feeds the will. And of course, that will 
in particular this particular stage of dependent origination and is meaning the will of your next life this is what keeps the rebirth happening and you know, to prove that in a very simple description when awija stops sankara stops when sankara stops then awija stops hang on that means when a person's enlightened they become unconscious not in this life in the next life there is no next life the consciousness stops finishes it's ended nothing to keep it going anymore in the next life so this is your last life and as far as the nama rupa awija and name and form the best description is that uh, awija so no sorry i got that wrong the vinyana and name and form that when there is vinyana there's nama rupa when there's nama rupa there's vinyana and the buddha describes it as two uh two sheaves of reeds or of straw leaning against one another as you see in the fields it's the way they can dry out and so that one leans against the other when one disappears the other one disappears when one sheaf is taken away the other one falls over so vinyana is almost like the screen and consciousness is what is played out on the sorry nama rupa is the objects of consciousness what is played out on the screen so when one disappears when there's nothing going on in the mind then the vinyana stops all the six consciousnesses stop and disappear they depend on having something to be conscious of there's nothing to be conscious of and one sheaf of reed is taken away the other one disappears as well uh, that's the dependent origination or as i prefer to call it dependent cessation because dependent origination is just too much about causes of things what about how things end how things cease how they disappear and this is exactly what the buddha said dependent origination and dependent cessation the two of them together but many times people just go to dependent origination they forget the most important part dependent cessation i prefer not to start a new job but to finish them cessation is much more fun wonderful thank you Ajahn Baron. To get inspired by in our meditation. So we okay, so a short meditation break. Yeah, okay. And in this meditation break, because you know, there's so many old people like me. <laughs> <laughs> so if you need to go to the toilet, it's a wonderful opportunity to take 10 minute toilet break. Or if you want to meditate, please meditate. So I will guide the meditation because you can't just speak it, you do it as well. I try to keep it to 10 minutes. So close your eyes and bring all your awareness to this moment, to this body of yours. Forget about all the questions which we've answered so far, the answer to your satisfaction, or you're just waiting to, to say something back. Forget about all of that. This is giving your brain some peace and as for the future always remember that now is where your future is made right now you're creating the future so if you want a very peaceful happy future a healthy future put all your focus in this moment right now the only time you ever have and we start with relaxing our bodies. So be aware of your body sitting here. How do you do that? Ask your body, body, how are you? Really sincerely ask your body as a friend, not as an owner. The friend, how are you? What do you need, body? Are your legs, are you okay? The way you're positioned? Do you need to be adjusted? But I always check on my bottom because sometimes I'm sitting here and talking. I don't realize this. It may be really uncomfortable. 
waist. I go right through my body, sometimes slowly, sometimes fast. I feel my back, feel my shoulders. I learn how to relax. If any part of my body is not at ease, I stop there and pause. I give it kindness, attention. Maybe my robe is a bit too tight. Or maybe just my positioning, my posture is not so good. So this is where my body just says, thank you for paying attention to me. And it will adjust itself most of the time. Or I might move my hands until I get the, the best position I possibly can this evening. This evening in Australia now. And then I go up to my head. And I pay special attention to relaxing all the muscles around my eyes and my mouth. Because they actually convey, show other people your emotional stress. And if those muscles are relaxed, your face looks so peaceful. Rightly so, because you've relaxed everything. And just as a little extra this evening, or this morning, if you wish, then I focus on, actually, actually more like imagination. I imagine a couple of inches behind my eyes and in the middle between my ears, my brain. I had a busy day today. My poor old brain is tired. So I just imagine my brain tired. I tell my brain for the next five minutes, you can take a break. You don't need to think. You don't need to work everything out. You don't need to take notes. You don't need to argue. Take a rest, brain. When I imagine like that, it actually works. My brain becomes more at peace. Don't have so many thoughts. And then I just become aware of my whole body just sitting here. If you can see my posture now, it's not exactly the posture you'd see in any meditation book. It feels good. That to me is sufficient. It feels good. And I relax it even more. I can notice I've got a bit of tummy ache, only a small bit of tummy ache and indigestion because today's meal was uh, outside. People were feeding me with Northeastern Thai food. It was delicious, but maybe <laughs> not good for my tummy. It's okay though, I can relax my intestines. And it works, the tightness, the inflammation starts to disappear. And I feel my body, being aware of your body is one way of remaining in this moment because physical feelings in your body only occur now. And it's important for you. I'm never trying to get rid of things, I'm caring for everything. When I care for my body in this moment like this, soon my body becomes delightful. It's more relaxed than it was a few moments ago. And there's this delight in physical relaxation, which I focus on now. The pleasurable feeling of a relaxed body. And that keeps my attention on the relaxation. And it takes it deeper. I feel more relaxed than about 20 seconds ago. And I realize that delight is a part of our meditation path. It's only a short meditation. 
and now I just go to my emotional world, my mind. And to get in contact with my mind, I develop this perception of the peaceometer, just like thermometer, speedometer. How peaceful are you now? Give it a number from one to ten. One is really peaceful, ten is agitated. How peaceful are you? Because this is a very important part of your mind, how peaceful it is. What makes it more peaceful? What takes that initial reading and reduces it, moving it closer to one? What is the cause of peace inside of you? For me, it's being in this moment, getting putting aside all this busyness of the past and the future. It's also putting aside all this, these words, the description, trying to criticize this moment. All of that I let go of. It's I am in this moment. Silent, present moment awareness. Until that silence becomes delightful. So beautiful being in this moment. Such a relief, freedom, not having to give things names. The longer I stay in this present moment in silence, the more I recognize that peace is joy, the more that peace and joy grow. When that natural peace and joy becomes strong, there's nothing I want in the whole world. It's nothing I feel that I'm missing. A deep contentment, which means I stay here. Why wander off anywhere? And this present moment is just so delightful. And I notice doesn't matter how tired or exhausted you may feel. You start to feel the delight in the present moment in silence. The energies start to come back into your mind. You become more aware. Mindfulness becomes empowered. Enhanced perception. Feels pretty cool. Oh dear, I'm enjoying it too much. Better come out. <laughs> okay, so how do you feel? Please open your eyes now. When you come out of meditation, please smile. And bring some of the joy out there into the world with you. Thank you for letting me do that. Yay. Very Ooh. Yeah, quite a lot of deep questions, Ajahn, and also some yep. 
um, daily life questions as well. So yeah, please. I'm not sure what you fancy doing next. A uh, bit of each is up to you. Okay, great. So let's talk again about the mind. Yes, so when the suttas talk about the impingement of the senses and its objects, one of them talks about the mind, mental objects, and mental consciousness. From what I understand, the mind in this case is talking about a potential space rather than that of a physical body as eyes, ears, nose. The mind mm -hmm. is different from mental consciousness, which involves attention and awareness, and which gives rise to the relationship between mind and mental objects. Am I right in understanding it this way? Notice the mind is your mental consciousness and its objects. The way that the Buddha used these words, in my understanding, was just as ordinary people would. He was not legally trained. He was not philosophically precise. So which is one of the reasons why that in a couple of places, he said that which people call the mind, the citta, or consciousness, vijnana, or mano, another word for mind. It was recognizing that people use these words almost interchangeably. But this particular, the sixth consciousness, mental consciousness, what most people call the mind. So now that is just like the other uh, five senses. It needs an object to turn on. When that object is not there, the mind just vanishes, it turns off. Sometimes people ask you, you know, when you are, say, having an operation, when you're under anesthetic, where's your mind gone? It hasn't gone anywhere, it's just stopped for a while. The mind is not permanent. It's um, like everything else, it's anicca, it's not always there. You need something to turn it on. And when there's nothing there to turn it on, it stops for a while. So people in the world, we always feel that the mind or consciousness is something which is really permanent, which is always there. One of the reasons is because when we're here and we're knowing things, that of course the mind is there. When the mind is gone, we don't know it's gone because you know, we're not there to know it. But little by little, we can see everything. And in your deep meditations, you can figure it all out. This mind consciousness, like everything else. It's impermanent, it's unsatisfactory, and it's uh, not mine, it's not me, it's not who I am. When are we coming up to the hard ones, the hard questions? <laughs> <laughs> I think you had them actually. <laughs> ah, so, come on. speak it for themselves so could we invite shirosha yeah. to unmute and you can ask the question shirosha can't see anyone hello hello Hi. Ajahn ram hello venerable chandra Hi. thank you for taking my question um oh, you're welcome uh, tell uh, one so and i <laughs> Thank you. Um, so the three characteristics of existence, the tilakana. Yes. Uh, the third one where they are, where it said uh, sabbe dhamma anat anatta. Yes. Yeah. What is meant by dhammas, like as opposed to sankaras, and why is it not self? Uh, and does yes. ni and does Nibbana come into that ca category? Thank you, Ajahn. Really, Nibbana doesn't come into any category because Nibbana means the ending of things. It's a cessation, it's a nothingness. So it is, uh, uh, but it's not as if it's exempted somehow from everything. It just it means nothing's left. <laughs> so, but when it comes to Sabe Sankara, and, sorry, Sabe Dhamma Anatta, it means Everything is not a self. There's no sort of great cosmic consciousness, which is the ultimate reality of our, uh, our universe. Everything is anatta, non-self, not a being, not a permanent essence. I prefer using the word permanent essence uh, for the word anatta. 
because that's really what people mean by it. Something uh, inside a human being or a group of human beings, which is always there, always going to be there, permanent, which is like the, the heart, the essence of everything. And just to um, add something there, because I was a, a physicist, I no, well, still really am a physicist, uh, as well as a monk, that you know that the word for atom was like called indivisible. It's a Greek word. And uh, you can't spit it up. But then we had the great uh, Kiwi physicist, Rutherford, he split the atom and showed you know, there was nothing which is you can't spit up. But then he wasn't the first to, to spit up things because even the Buddha spit mm -hmm. up the atoma. Atom, atoma, one is physical, one is spiritual. And you know, I'm sure that because the English language and the Greek language and the Indo Aryan languages, you know, it's part of the Indo Aryan language uh, um, group, there must be some connection there. Atoma the essential unsplittable essence of a human being. But the Buddha split it up and showed there was nothing there. And that's the same. Sabe Dhamma Anatta, all things are not a permanent essence. Thank Make you, Adam. Yes, no, okay. thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Very good. You're welcome. one now about uh, relationships okay this out on behalf of someone else how do you let go of somebody that you don't have a relationship with but past interactions make you strongly believe and feel that this person is the one for you and has been your life partner in past lives currently the circumstances do not allow for a relationship and the future does not seem favorable for one to happen but this notion of being together is deeply engraved and it's stunting growth and progress. Okay. It's, it's How do I really, really let go of this person? How you really let go of this person is see if you can change the way that you perceive these so-called relationships. Sometimes when you see something at a distance, you don't see some of its faults and defects. <laughs> And sometimes seeing faults and defects in things when it's close to you means that, well, you may have had a relationship before, but it's finished, the karma's over. So see if you can be more free instead of having a relationship with people. And have a relationship with truth. Have a relationship with like Dhamma. And that's the best relationship to have, a, have something with. So with, with a person, you know, sometimes the person gets old. Sometimes you think that they're your life partner, your soulmate. But you know, for Buddhism, when we don't believe in the soul, it's very hard to say there's a soulmate. <laughs> so after a while, that seeing things at a distance, we give them characteristics which they don't really uh, deserve. You, know, you look at your body. And you now from a distance, you think, oh, you look very healthy. It's nice and beautiful body. You get closer and closer and closer. You can see all its defects. You, go, you can see just even this world. Well, this was a story which came today from those Northeastern people. The lady said that um, part of uh, some of her relations, it was a close family, a uh, few of her relations, they won the lottery. I didn't say were, a lot of money. And that was the end of their relationship with their, their auntie, their mother, because they just didn't want to see her anymore. They became, she called them snobs. And we always think that, oh, that when we win a lottery, when we get lots of money, we'll be happy ever after. Just the same as when Prince Charming and Cinderella meet and ride off into the sunset, they'll be happy ever after. They don't sort of uh, think about sort of paying the mortgage for their house or the, <laughs> the guards arguing, all the difficulties which comes afterwards. Sometimes we want happiness so much that we just fantasize and we think that that's our life. A soulmate, a relationship, you've had relationships before. I've had relationships and they're wonderful at the time, but then after a while, so it all fades apart and you think, is this it? There must be something more to life than just relationships. And of course there is. 
but understanding who you are and being at peace and giving such kindness, such love to all beings. You don't need them. You just give, but you don't need them right next to you. I have a question here from someone who's feeling not very happy. Mm. So they say, last year when my brother passed away, I was overwhelmed mentally and tried many times to end my life. I clung on because my father was around. My dad passed away in April and I don't feel that I can live without my, with my dad not being here. I'm struggling to find a purpose and a reason for living. I don't see what people see that I'm a good person and loved. I feel that yeah. I'm a burden to everybody. Well, first of all, um, don't allow when somebody passes away just to think of what's been taken away from you. They always say that death is a loss. But I say that's just looking at just a small part of a person's life and existence. You see the whole time you've had with your father or with the other people, you know, who have now no longer here, but you've had them for so many years. And their memories often stay with you. And that's in the old simile which I gave of the concert. I remember you came and go to all these great concerts. I remember seeing the very first concert <laughs> of Led Zeppelin <laughs> in the Marquee Club. <laughs> and I know you liked them when you were a young lady, Venerable Chanda. And I was there with my long hair. You know, my mother always told me to get my hair cut. When I actually did, she said, that's not what I meant. <laughs> I became a monk. That's how I got my hair cut. Before that, it was long. And anyway, after the concert, you clap. You stand up, you shout for more, and as the encore happens, and after the encore is finished, you have to leave. And the band leaves as well. And the chance of ever you seeing, you can't see a first concert ever again. So you know that all those great performances, you leave them and you want to hear them again. But I never cried, never once, at the end of a great concert. Instead you thought, how lucky I was, how fortunate I was to have been there at the time. I learned so much from that great music. That's precisely how I felt when my father died, when my mother died, when everybody else, because I'm getting old now, all some old friends dead. And I think, wow, what a wonderful time we had together. It was marvelous, like a great concert. So I never feel grief when somebody dies. I feel thank you for being there for all those years with me. And all those wonderful memories and jokes we used to share with one another. Oh, that's great. So I never look at grief as something sad. It's, it's not really grief. It's, it literally is celebration of that life. Seeing the whole thing, not just the death and what happens afterwards. What happened before. And also that... When we are sad like that, we always see the worst in life. And we, we literally do not think that people really care about us and love us. And it's amazing just you know, how many people will sort of, you know, will care about you and love you. I remember as reading this, I always like reading weird articles, but there was a gentleman over in the United States and he, you know, he was dying of cancer. He didn't have that much long to live. But he did something unique. He decided to have his funeral before he died. So, you know, it was a couple of weeks before he actually passed away, he got the box out there, it was empty, and he had his funeral because he said he always wanted to listen to what people really thought of him, which they would do at the funeral. He'd say all these eulogies. <laughs> I was listening to all of the eulogies before he passed away, he was really inspired, impressed what people really thought of him. It wasn't what he thought people thought of him. So the person who has made that question, what you think people think of you is not really what they think of you. They care about you much more than you'd ever imagine. And it's also, he said, that you can also find out who came to his funeral while he still had a chance to amend the will. <laughs> 
please, I'm sorry for saying silly things like that, but that's what he said in the little article to find out how many people really cared for him, which was amazing to see. Another one about meditation here and about the hindrances. So this person says, I often notice sensory desire and ill will interacting during daily activities. For example, if I'm hungry, I might have some resentment towards preparing food because I'd rather be eating it. This produces a true <laughs> feeling of dissatisfaction, which I assume is dukkha. Can I use these everyday situations to weaken the first two hindrances in a way that will also help to deepen my meditation? Yeah, sure, you can weaken them, but don't weaken them so much you don't eat. <laughs> Otherwise you will die. So this is part of life. You know, to have food, you know, we have to buy it or cook it and then eat it. And it takes time. And sometimes, uh, you know, in my life, you eat food, which you don't really know exactly what it is. Somebody gives it to you and they say, oh, this is really good, Ajahn Mami, you must eat this. And I get tummy cake afterwards. <laughs> But it's part of life. So it's a part of the suffering, the physical suffering of life, of having to work, having to stay up late, having to do chores. But remember, that's a physical part of suffering. The mental part of suffering is, you know, how you react to that. Well, it's part of life. Yeah, I got a bit of tummy ache today, but there's, the people who gave me food today had so much joy and fun. If that happened tomorrow, I'll go back there tomorrow. Even though I know it's going to make me a little bit uncomfortable, it's worth it because the joy and happiness which the people had of looking after you and feeding you that day. So the same with cooking food. Yeah, you've got to cook food. So put fun, enjoy it. See what happens. And just cleaning up afterwards. Yeah, it's all you have to do. Everyone has to clean up and wash dishes. Even me. So this, <laughs> I'm supposed to be a senior monk. I'm supposed to have attendants doing looking after me, but of course they don't. They're back in the hut meditating now, which is where they should be. But anyway, nevertheless, the mental suffering, that is something which you have control over in the sense of you can create joy and happiness with whatever you're doing by changing your attitude. The physical part of life, of having to go to the doctor to get tested for COVID, having to just be cold or to be hot. That is part of our life. That type of suffering is not the same as the mental suffering. The mental suffering is like an unskillful reaction. So look at the mental suffering and put aside the physical suffering, which you can't really control. So now there's a question about jhanas and how they relate to enlightenment. Aha. Uh -huh. so I'll try and summarise the question. Uh, well, maybe I'll just read it. It's probably easier. Okay. So for attaining the four noble attainments of stream winning, once returning, non-returning and arahatship, is the perfect stillness reached through jhanas enough? Or is it necessary to go into jhanas, then emerge from them and then ponder with superpower mindfulness? I'm asking this question because I've listened to your Dhamma talks and I've heard you encourage meditators to, after they come out of jhanas, investigate with super mindfulness created as a result of the five hindrances being subdued. How does this really work? Can someone really become a stream winner if they progress through all jhana stages, one after the other, without even having to emerge? Mm. Of course you have to emerge. Otherwise, if you enter a jhana and don't come out, then I'll be for years and years and you will die in the jhanas. And then you go to the jhana realms. But in real life, people enter the jhanas and they come out. And which particular one it is, is not really important. But the answer to that question is well explained by the simile, one of my favorite similes, of the tadpole uh, who grew up in a monastery lake. So little tadpole, she was born in the water. She grew up in the water. And it's only a, a metaphor, okay? So in that lake, there was a school. So she went to school and she did really well. She passed her O-levels and A-levels and went to university in the little lake where she studied chemistry 
and then she did a PhD on the nature of water. And she even being a monastery lake, she even learned some Abhidharma on the nature of water. But how can a tadpole know what water is? All the study in the world, all the arguments, all the lectures in the world, she can't know because she was born in the water, lived all her life in the water, like a fish can't know what water is. But with the tadpole, it's different than a fish because one day, little tadpole, she grows legs and arms. She becomes a frog. And one day, little tadpole, not really know what she was doing, she you know, becomes like a human being, becomes a meditator. And then one day, she doesn't really know what she's doing, but she jumps out of the lake just like the person experiences a jhana for the first time. You're outside of the sensory world, of the five senses, outside of karma loka, and you're on dry ground. And that's really different, surprisingly, shockingly different, to the point that afterwards, the little tadpole, now a frog, now I can understand what water is, that strange stuff which had disappeared when I was in jhanas. So this is actually how the experiences of jhanas put many things which you just cannot see, which you thought were always really permanent, but now they disappeared, they're gone. And you can experience that. You can experience anicca. But these things aren't really you. Weird things you thought were essential are now gone. So that's actually how jhana is necessary. Otherwise, you can't really see anatta. You can't see anicca. Many people think anicca are oh, impermanence. Yeah, that's really easy. It's much more than impermanence. It's like looking at a lake in the mountains. And you can see the waves on the lake. They go up, they go down. You can see it's not still. That is not impermanence, that is superficial. But when you're looking at that lake in the mountains, and then for no reason whatsoever, the whole lake vanishes, it disappears, it's not there anymore. Nor is the sky above, or the mountains around it, or the earth underneath it, it's all gone. And you're perfectly aware. Wow, that is great insight possibilities. It is the experience of the jhanas where little tadpole becomes frog. So that's how it works, a little simile. Tadpole and the frog. Can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Something happens. My computer keeps almost blacking out. Anyway, I wanted to invite um, Benjamin to ask a question if he's still there. We'd like to ask the question in person. Oh, good. Hi. Um, so my question is about the experience of um, independent versus guided meditation, so guiding yourself. Um, so unguided meditation winds up often being unsatisfying. It doesn't feel as deep. Um, and yet it's what is most often available. Um, it brings its own kind of frustration, being unsatisfying. And I'm even aware and knowing of, of that as it's happening. What guidance would you have for someone who gets caught up in this frustration to the point that it winds up um, almost superseding the experience of meditation? It's like, turn off the guidance. The reason why we have guided meditation is just like when you learn how to drive a car. You do need a driving instructor sitting next to you to save your life and to save the car and other people's lives as well. But once you know how to drive a car, you don't need a, a driving instructor anymore. So the guided meditation is there for you to get the hang of what meditation is. And then you do it by yourself. You turn off all this, this noise. 
and then you sit quietly. And if you find, well, maybe I do need a bit more instruction, then maybe just once a week have a guided meditation, all the other times, meditate by yourself. Um, Until um, eventually. Could I just interrupt you there? Yeah. Please. Because I think the gentleman was actually saying that he prefers the guided meditation and that the meditation is not as deep without the guidance. And that was the, the struggle, wasn't it? Yes. Oh, so well, either, yeah. Oh, well, if that's the case, then, then you need more guidance. And sometimes what you can do, you can, uh, I'm sure you can um, hack the system or just uh, get your, not really hacking the system, get the computer to such that, okay, 10 minutes of guided meditation and then your computer goes silent. You carry on, you just use it to get started. And once you get started, carry on by yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Very good, Benjamin. Um, we have a question about rebirth, Ajahn. So could Ajahn Brown say something about the Buddhist attitudes to rebirth? What did the Buddha say? And previously this person had asked me about the mechanisms of how it actually works. So if you could maybe explain it a little bit so that they can Certainly. understand. Yeah, it, it was actually in, first of all, the history of reincarnation, rebirth. It was 543 AD that it was Emperor, ah, I forget, I think Emperor Julius. And there was a Pope, uh, Pope Vigilius, I think his name was. And the Pope was really into reincarnation, but the emperor was not. And the emperor told the Pope, look, ban reincarnation, make it anathema. And the Pope refused. So actually the, the religious authority at the time was very much into reincarnation. And so you know what did the Pope do in those days? He put the Pope, so then what did the, the emperor do? The emperor put the Pope in jail for one year. And after one year in jail, the Pope said, I don't believe in reincarnation anymore. It was just too unpleasant for him. And then they, they had the Council of Nicaea, which made it an anathema. And it just political forces, not religious forces, took rebirth, reincarnation out of our Western system. But anyway, to, to me, it was obvious that people get reborn, reincarnated, if you like. And... I remember just years ago giving a talk uh, in the Sri Lankan Vihara, the London Buddhist Vihara, uh, over when it was still in, uh, in Heathrow Gardens. And after the talk on reincarnation, they introduced one of the boys who was one of the subjects of um, Professor Ian Stevenson's research. And he talked to me, it was about 18 or 19, this boy at the time, he said it was the worst thing I ever did was to tell my parents you know, who I was before I was born. Because it became in the newspapers and at school I was teased day in, day out by my fellow friends. It was torture. All my friends would tease me, how is your wife today? It was only about eight or nine years of age. And so to me that hearing from a person like that and just people don't say about rebirth simply because you know, they get something out of it. They sacrifice a lot to tell their own stories of rebirth. And for those of you in UK, that one of the people who I used to like when I was growing up, he was a very good comedian, Roy Hudd, H-U-D-D. -D. He was coming back one evening after a, a show at a theater, a new one-way system in London, he got totally lost. He went down a street he thought he'd never been down before. And just all the goosebump experience, he realized he had been in that street before in his previous life. And he recognized the house. And it was the house of a former entertainer, which was probably even more famous than Roy Hudd. Uh, it was, was it Lino? Dan Lino, a famous musical performer. And this Roy Hudd knocked at the door of the house and he'd never been in that house before in this life. Because he was on the TV, the occupants recognized him. Roy Hudd, what are you doing here? He said, I used to live here. Said, no, you didn't. We've been in this house for, you know, since the Second World War or something. 
And then he took them around their house and showed them all the changes, renovations, where a window had been taken out, windows had been put in. And they were just astounded. His recollection was perfect. And as a result of him writing this article about his recollection of his previous life, also as an entertainer, that he got sacked from, I think it was the ITV at the time, because the head of the ITV was a very devout Christian Catholic, I think. Don't want anyone like you on in my service. But nevertheless, he carried on writing books, became the expert historian on this famous musical entertainer called Mr. Dan Leno, L-E-N-O. But most times when people actually do say about their previous lives, they usually suffer for it immensely. They don't get anything out of it, but they actually get a lot of uh, suffering. But anyway, just when you understand what the nature of the mind is, this mind is independent of the five senses of the physical body. You know, in our Western world, we always think of five senses. Even Plato, Aristotle would always say the six senses. If you ever read Plato's Republic, the last chapter is about reincarnation, about the river Leith, L-E-T-H-E. Oh no, sorry, river Styx, S-T-Y-X, and going to the Elysian fields, uh, where they said they would rest between lives, and then going over the river Leith, uh, which is forgetfulness in Greek, to your next life. And, and this was part of our culture for so many years, but it's been taken away. And sometimes that when you think about it, it's just so obvious. If you know what the nature of the mind is, this mind is not destroyed when a person dies. And so after a while, you realize ghosts, other beings, they're real. I was a member of the Psychic Research Society for many years. And one of my best friends, I don't mind mentioning his name, Professor Bernard Carr, he was one of the best friends at Cambridge when I was there. Bernard became, he was at the, uh, he's now Emeritus Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of London, uh, Queen Mary College. And he was such a close disciple of Stephen Hawkins that he was featured on Stephen Hawkins' movie, the, was it the Theory of Everything or something. And a very brilliant man, also the president of the Psychic Research Society in London. You investigated things like previous lives. And the evidence is convincing. And so, you know, if there's anything else in life, we'd say, well, of course, it's, it's part of life. You know, there is reincarnation, rebirth. And there's many people who have those experiences, usually between the ages of two and maybe six or seven. And this is part of life. You know, where's my wife? You know, I've been in this house before or something. It's very rare that people are reminded later on in their life. But in the early years of their life, the kids just blurt it out. And, but no, the, the culture does not support it. And after a while, they just disappear. But how that actually works, when you die, five senses stop. That You're dead. Okay, you can't see, hear, smell, taste, touch. But the mind continues on. That's why people have out-of-the-body experiences or near-death experiences. The great work by people like Pim Van Lommel, Professor Pim Van Lommel, who saw that you know the people who have these out of the body experiences, they're basically brain dead at the time. Nothing's working in their brain. It cannot be. It cannot be produced by um, some phenomena from the brain. And clear memories, memories like the famous um, tennis shoe where somebody in a hospital, I think in Britain somewhere, they said, yeah, they floated out of their body and just up you know, high in one of the high windows, there's a tennis shoe on the ledge. They said, yeah, come on, don't be ridiculous. This is a sterile environment. We clean it. You can't have a tennis shoe up there. And of course, you couldn't see it from down below, but they got a ladder up and of course, there was a tennis shoe there. And this is, some of these um, evidences are just very very convincing so your mind separates from the body and the mind this mind consciousness with this object continues on and either goes to a you know say a heaven realm or a hell realm but 
These aren't made ready for you to go there. You make them yourself as you feel you deserve. So hell realms, yeah, if you feel guilty and you feel, you know, people do, it's a crazy idea, but they feel they're not deserving happiness. They need to be punished. And they create sort of a realm of punishment for themselves. And they can leave at any time when they forgive themselves and have some kindness, compassion. Heaven realms, you create them. However long you want. And of course, when a person finishes with those realms, they can come back to this realm or other realms. And people keep asking, well, how come there's so many people alive today? There's more people alive today than probably have ever died. So where did all these extra people come from? There's so few animals alive today. We've taken over their habitats. And if you do the numbers, you understand that many people alive today were animals in their past life. And that's not demeaning animals or demeaning people. Animals, especially high animals, they're just amazingly kind, compassionate, and even uh, the animals which can actually speak. Alex the parrot, if you want to get on YouTube and see Alex the parrot. First time I saw him, he was taught language. He could converse with people. And that really shocked me, but it's true, it's real. So, the difference between human beings and animals is not that great. Sorry for going on a long time, but... Thank you, Arjan. No, um, I still have many, many questions, but I've just looked through them and maybe three or four kind of stand out. I was okay. wondering if we could uh, maybe go through another three, four questions. Yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, okay. If it, yeah, if you go over time, I don't mind. All right. So if anybody else has to go, don't worry about it. You can catch it later on Facebook Live or on our YouTube channel. Um, but I imagine that most of you want to stick around, so you're very welcome to do so. So this is a long question, but an important one. So a few years ago, I visited a Buddhist teacher and we had very intense conversations staring into each other's eyes. Her face started to look odd to me and I asked her if she could show me who she really was. She did not say anything. Instead, I saw a black hole open up in her forehead and expand into a large circle before closing. At first, I was absolutely stunned and still. And then after a few minutes, my mind became active and I became very confused and unable to process the experience. I started to think that she must be Jesus and I developed other strange delusions. An ambulance was called and I was hospitalized for manic wow. psychosis. This has been my only experience with psychosis. My question is, does this event have any Buddhist significance or was I simply experiencing mental illness? Is it possible that I did see emptiness and it crashed my mind? Yeah, it's probably what you saw for what you say to me. There was not a problem there at all that you were looking for something and your mind managed to, to concoct something and to perceive it in a way which not, no one else could perceive. Look, I'll tell you something similar, which may reassure you. There was, um, uh, when I was in Penang many years ago, and uh, the disciples over there said, can you please give a few minutes to this lady who's had a psychosis? No one can help her. She's not a Buddhist, but you know she had some experience, and, and she's been to so many psychologists, psychiatrists, and people. And the, she came in front of me, and I just asked her, well, what, what's, the, what's the problem? What happened? And then she said what happened to her, and I listened intently to every word, not interrupting her. And when she finished, I said, I, I know what you had. That was a jhana experience. And I added a few extra things, you know, which I know about those states, which he had mentioned to me. He said, yes, yes, that's it. What had happened, she'd fluked to deep meditation, the jhana, and no one else had understood what she was going through, and they called it a psychosis. She wasn't mentally ill. She'd had an experience which no one else could understand. So your experience, even though you say who you really are, and that teacher, you know, didn't know really what to answer. She wasn't showing you anything, it's what you were seeing. You know, a, a hole come up, an emptiness. 
Now that was how your mind interpreted that particular phenomena. And your mind is amazing what it can do. So if you'd have come to me and said, oh, it's really great, that's really nice, if that's what it means, you haven't got psychosis at all, it's just you're seeing things in a, in a way which most other people don't see it. But just carry on and just have your lunch and go back to work. But it's the way we react to these phenomena. That is what causes a psychosis. It's not the experience itself. You put it into its right perspective, it's just unusual, but quite ordinary. Not dangerous at all. As a monk, you know, being meditating, I've had some weird experiences. But I don't know that the way, but what was that in, ah, oh, many of you may know this place, Throssel Hall, over in Northumberland. And I would go to any place to meditate when I was a student. And I was meditating in there and I didn't know what to do. They just said, watch, to keep your eyes open, watch the wall. And I was still enough and peaceful enough. I was just watching this wall in the meditation center and then the wall vanished. It just disappeared into nothingness. There was nothing there, which was really weird. But instead of getting scared and reacting, say, oh, I've had some psychosis or something, I say, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> what it really was was just my mind was becoming still. and seeing all sorts of wonderful things. So, don't, um, don't uh, confuse meditation experiences with psychosis. Okay, so this is about meditation. This person says, I'm fairly new to meditation, and although I prefer to close my eyes, when I, when I do, I experience quite an intense swaying or rocking sensation, even though I'm sitting still. How can I overcome this? For goodness sake, don't try to overcome it. Don't control it. <laughs> there, was, <laughs> there was one lady years ago that she asked the same question to me, the very same question. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll watch you the next meditation. And I'm watching her the next meditation. She said, yeah, did you see me swaying? I said, I watched every moment of you and you weren't swaying at all. You were perfectly still. She didn't believe me. And so I got somebody else to watch as well. This was just a perception she had of swaying, which she was actually perfectly still. There are some people who actually do really sway. Let yourself sway. It's just what the body needs to do. It's not your job to control your body. Don't even try to overcome it. Make peace with it. Be kind to it. Open your doors of perception to that reality. If it really is sway. I don't know why the body needs to do that, but it's fixing up some sort of problem in the body. And let the body decide how it's going to heal itself. You butt out and let it sway. Okay. Just a couple more questions. So this person's asking, if Ajahn says that heaven and hell is a mind-made realm, what about heavenly beings in the suttas? Heavenly beings in the suttas, that's where they're around in the suttas. And those beings sometimes, oh, sometimes we miss our friends. And sometimes, or oh, sometimes that something happens that they can even help. I don't know how many people have had heavenly beings come to assist you. And it's weird, but okay, one of the great stories was of this uh, American guy. Oh, this is weird, but because I know everybody involved in this, and it's true. He was working in the Peace Corps in Thailand. He wanted to become a monk. He didn't know what to do to become a monk. He asked a concierge at the hotel, who knows other places where Americans can go, but he didn't really know where to go to a good monastery. But he said, there's one monastery in the center of Bangkok, Wat Pawan, there's some Westerners go there. So go there, go early in the morning, take some food, and offer it to one of the monks and ask to become a monk yourself. So when he went there, it was all closed up. He went there far too early. He was walking up and down outside, didn't know what to do. And then a Thai gentleman who spoke perfect English came up to him to make sure he was okay. And when he said he wanted to become a monk, the Thai gentleman sort of said, well, it's too early now, but I can take you inside. I've got the keys and went through this iron gate, opened the gate, 
went into the main hall where people are ordained, explained all of the paintings in great detail to him. Time went past, and when it was finished, he led him outside, said, just go and stand over there. The monk will be out in a few minutes, which he did. And then uh, he started his training to become a monk, but he couldn't understand the people giving him the instructions. So he said, haven't you got anyone who can speak proper English in this monastery? He said, no, this is our best. But what about that layman who took me inside? And that's when they all stopped. What layman? The layman who opened the door. He said, you can't open the door there. That's the royal gate. Only royal family of Tyler can go through that gate. And I know that's true. And because that's what he said, he was taken to the abbot's office immediately. When the abbot started listening to what he was saying, he said, that's impossible. Stop. And he brought in the secretary to record everything. Only kings were allowed through that gate. You can't even turn on the electricity of that place. No one has got the keys to the main hall except, I think, the abbot and a couple of senior monks. And not even the old abbot knew the story behind all those wall paintings. And after recording everything, they asked this young American, sort of, you know, what did the fellow look like? And he, like I don't know. He was just the type. He was, he was wearing old fashioned clothes, good clothes. What did he look like? And like many people, you're scratching your head and thinking, and then the American stopped and froze. It's him, that a portrait of him on the wall. It was King Rama V, an old king of Thailand who had since died many years ago, who was the main sponsor. He actually built that meditation hall. He could go through those gates because he was royalty. And I told that story so many times. I remember telling it in the Thai ambassador's residence in Singapore many years ago. And the Thai ambassador said, yeah, I know that story, it's true. So that man be eventually became a monk in one of the forest monasteries in Thailand. And then he went to the United States. But I won't tell you his name because when things like that happen, you don't want to bring attention to people. It's weird, but true. Heavenly beings who sometimes come and help if you really need it. There are still lots more questions, so I'm not sure how much time you think we could. No, I'm happy to go for another half an hour. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> Great. So let's go for this one. My adult son says hurtful things when he gets angry at me, and then I push uh. him away. He never says sorry, and this makes me angry as it seems to be me that always says sorry. Yeah. Remember, he's not getting angry at you. He's getting angry at how he feels inside. So if anyone gets angry at you, oh, you must be really hurting. You must be really upset. So just give him a hug. He gets angry at you and your response is not to walk away or to throw away or criticize him. It's just people's feelings inside. I don't know how old your son is, but you know sometimes they're learning about relationships in the world. They're learning about the amazing things happening in their own body. And it doesn't matter. You can always say sorry. He would eventually say sorry. You know, if, you know, he, would, he would eventually just um, express his love to you. You're his mum. He'd always love you. But the fact he gets angry at you and says rotten things at you, that's don't ever think that he doesn't love you and care for you. This is just a, a young man growing up. So keep on loving him, being kind to him, getting his favorite food or whatever, and just uh, understand that his anger is not a reflection on any of your conduct. It's a reflection on how he feels, a young man growing up. Okay, we have a question here from India about dreams. So mm. this person saying, do dreams relate to karma? Do they have something to do with the past life? Do they have any meaning? Well, sometimes if you dream something many, many times, and it's a very clear dream, 
then it could do. So, but usually I say it has to be repeated. Just one dream is not enough to really depend upon. But if you keep dreaming it again and again and again, then maybe, maybe there is something there. This is, <laughs> this is a little bit of a, uh, uh, an answer which is off question, but it was a beautiful story which I read in a book uh, about heart transplants. Because uh, there was a young woman, she was only about nine, not a girl really, nine or ten years of age, and something wrong with her heart. So they managed to find a sort of a donor, someone who had died, and give her the heart. And it's obviously just a very traumatic operation. So she's in hospital for quite a while, but you know, she survived. But this young girl kept on having dreams about being an older woman who was murdered. And it was the same dream repeated again and again and again. She told her mother, and because it was a consistent dream, repeated several times, the mother just went to the police. And I went to the doctor, sorry, went to the doctor first of all, and said, look, my daughter's been having these dreams, these almost nightmares of being murdered. You know, is this anything to do with where the heart came from? And the GP said, oh no, it's a traumatic operation. You know, this will go away by itself. But the dreams were so powerful and repetitive, the mother thought, no, this doctor doesn't know what he's talking about. So it was the mother who went to the police. And the police were very interested because it bore a very close resemblance to an unsolved murder case. And so the police interviewed the young girl and with all the details which she gave them from her dream, they realized the original owner of the heart had died because of being murdered and the information they got was enough to find a suspect who confessed that he was the murderer. The dreams were true. And the dreams, you know, were there for a while, but then they disappeared from the heart transplant. It's weird. But anyway, so some dreams are actually true. Some dreams are not. And you cannot tell the difference between the two of them. Adam, this person is also asking um, that they haven't been able to find your books at all in India, not even online. I don't know if you know what's well, going on there or if you have any suggestions as to how they can find any of your books. Oh, the books are there. Maybe you try them from Sri Lanka. They may be able to get them from just over the, uh, the little, uh, little bit of sea. I know they're very readily available over there, but I think they're also available in India as well. But Amazon certainly has them. Do you have Amazon in India? Anyway, but I'm sure you can find them. Okay, we have one question here about the precepts. So someone yeah. is asking, please comment on how far the keeping the fifth precept matters to developing practice. It's the one I struggle with. Having an odd drink uh, and feeling guilty, but I don't, and I have an odd drink and feel guilty, but I don't know how important it is to put effort into stopping it. It's been on my mind for yeah. a long time and it worries me as it might be. Oh, no, I've lost it. <laughs> She's saying it might be stopping her development, I think. No, it's hard yeah. to find it. Quite likely. Um, but she doesn't actually see any difference, basically, if she has the odd drink. Well, I know that people always say about that precept, oh, come on, just a little drink every now and again is not so much a problem. And to make a point, I said, well, okay, just a little bit of breaking the first precept, just to murder someone every few years, just a little bit of thievery, the second precept, <laughs> just a little bit of sexual misconduct, a few affairs every now and again. It's only a few affairs every now and again. A little bit of lying doesn't matter, but the point is, of course it does. So, uh, even a small amount of alcohol, what do you want to take the alcohol for? Now, years and years ago, and I could give up alcohol, and I could still go to all the parties, as I tell people, I got invited to more parties when I gave up alcohol. 
And the reason was is because they wanted someone sober to drive them all home afterwards. <laughs> and that's my job. <laughs> so you don't need to have alcohol. I just give it up. And you'll find you'll feel much better because now it's like you're in charge of what you drink rather than being sort of uh, in, uh, controlled by the alcohol. Alcohol's not necessary. Does a dog drink alcohol? If you have a dog or a cat, just put a saucer of alcohol or whiskey out for the cat. See what the cat does. See what the dog does. Animals are quite wise. <laughs> okay. So uh, we want a little clarification here about um, what you said earlier about rebirth. So the person's asking, when you said that the mind continues on, does it mean the same mind looks for the new body to be reborn in when we die? Well, it's not the same mind. But this mind creates that mind, which creates the next mind, which creates the next mind, which creates the next mind. It's a process which continues. And to understand what that process is, the best simile which I came up with was, you know, you eat a mango. And then after a you know, delicious mango, nice and sweet, you know, uh, made of lots and lots of dog poo. <laughs> That's only an extra. But then after eating your mango, you plant the seed in the garden. And of course, a, a tree comes up after a few years and you eat the new mango. And the question is, what went from the first mango to the second mango? And you know that you can actually trace the whole process. First of all, when that seed is put in the ground and it splits, and it starts to germinate. And a little sort of plant pushes its way up through the soil until it just breaks the surface of the soil. It gets what looks like a piece of grass, first of all, but it's a, a mango growing. And as that mango grows, it becomes a little sapling. The sapling becomes a small tree. The tree gets bigger and eventually puts forth branches. And the branches have leaves. And then one day you see little flowers on the end of the leaves and the flowers get pollinated. And then they fatten up at their root and the, a bulge comes up and that bulge gets bigger and bigger and nice and green. And soon it starts to get yellow. It's a mango, a new mango. You can know every connection from one moment to the next of that mango tree but the even the molecules the dna of the old mango the new mango are different they're not the same they're slightly different so what went across from one to the other as the buddha would say they're not different but they're not the same it's a process that's just how this process of mind, the stream of consciousness, rolls on, changing little bit by little bit as we mature. Okay, um, this is a question about the Mahasi practice. So this person's asking, um, is the Mahasi practice particularly geared towards householders as they don't often have time to develop jhanas? And does practicing moment to moment mindfulness eventually give rise to momentary absorption, which is enough to look deeply into the three characteristics? Would you agree? Okay. Yeah, it's, actually it's a good insight there yourself. But it was actually uh, started by Lady Sidor in uh, Myanmar, L-E-D-I. And the reason why he started is he wanted to make meditation more accessible, not deeper meditation, but ex meditation generally. And the reason was it was just after the British Raj, who in Burma at the time, conquered Mandalay. And he thought that was the end of Buddhism in Myanmar, or Burma as it was then called. And so he started teaching this uh, method, which was then later taken over by many other teachers. Uh, but it was not supposed to uh, be an alternative to the Buddha's method of the Eightfold Path culminating in jhanas. Uh, it was supposed to be just what you can do to start off with and then to build that up. And you find out that you know, many people go on Mahasi uh, or that type of uh, we pass in the retreats. Some of them, they do get very still. 
And their stillness gets so strong, they do experience things, beautiful, bright nimittas and jhanas. It, there isn't two ways of meditation or five ways of meditation. It's just meditation, which is just letting go, becoming still, getting jhanas and getting insight afterwards. That's just a path of meditation. And just momentary jhanas, oh, if you know what jhanas are, you can't stay there for a moment. They're too powerful for that. They're too stable. So, you know, the jhanas, you know, it has to be at least sort of, you know, an hour or so, even like a first jhana. It's just too beautiful, wonderful. You can't just, you know, go to a Led Zeppelin concert just to go in there and come out afterwards, you know, just for one second. There's no momentary thing there. You have to stay there for a long time. Isn't that the case <laughs> when you're a young lady? So the whole idea is just a bit of a myth, a momentary. Instead of calling it concentration, I always prefer to call samadhi stillness. When you call it stillness, momentary stillness. <laughs> it's what's called an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense at all. Stillness is stable. And stability is notice is part of its uh, its characteristic. It lasts for a long time. Um, there's one more question, and then I was going to invite you to say a little bit about um, the Anukampa Bikuni project, Ajahn, if that's okay, good, yeah. okay with you. Yeah, so um, sure. this question is again about rebirth and how um, mm. we choose our particular rebirth. Oh, so yes. they're asking, seeing as most people are so attached to things like gender and ethnicity, how are people reborn outside these parameters? What kind of things would be of heavier weight? Is the people you are attached to and care for? So you find a lot of people get reborn in families they've been reborn into before. Or because they get attracted, that's what that's their known characteristics. So, they have an aspiration uh, in there before they die. They want to be reborn in this place after they die or something. So, and there's also the time that sometimes is just what's available. So they can only get you know, a, a rebirth in this place because that's the only available uh, room for hire, if you like, for, for your lifetime. So there's many, many reasons. There's aspirations. There's um, the purpose of what you're going to be reborn into? Because somebody once asked that question, and I get into trouble with these ideas, but no, I think it's they're valid. Does the Buddha have to be a man? And of course, our last Buddha, Buddha Gotama, was a male, because if he was born as a female in that generation, he wouldn't have got as much traction with his teachings. But our next Buddha, could they be born as a woman? Certainly. Have to be born in India? Why? Could be born in China? Could be born in US? Africa? Who knows? If you were going to be a Buddha, where would you choose to be reborn? Where you can have the greatest effect? And sometimes they realize that, yeah, that's, that's do a little bit for, for equity as well. Not just with white people and uh, white elite privilege. Let's be reborn in Africa. Why not? So you can see just why a person be reborn in a particular body. The, the, the Buddha's not white, black or yellow, or whatever. Not male or female. It's... No, it's not identifying with the body, the vehicle they drive. Just because you drive a, a Mercedes doesn't mean you're German. <laughs> it's, you know, these are just the vehicles which we choose. What's actually inside is more important. I know the, the suttas say that the Buddha is always going to be reborn as a man, but at that time you can see the logic behind that, but times have changed. to imagine that the next Buddha could be perhaps um, a queer black female. And it could also, yeah, it could also be, obviously once you're a monk or a nun, you don't have that sexuality anymore. You say, I was a queer, I yeah. was a, a lesbian or whatever. But anyway, it's wonderful that we do have now 
in Britain, fully ordained bikunis, which is wonderful. The Anakampa Bikuni Project, which you know, it's all right to listen to talks, but then sometimes we need to do something to make sure these talks happen more often. And not just from me, but just from Venerable Bikuni Chanda, who's is a bit of a hero in my eyes because she's there all by herself doing a huge amount of work. She does get very tired. I mean, she, this is, she probably gets embarrassed me saying this because, you know, just living in, there, in that house all by herself and the amount of admin work she does is immense. It would, it would torture many people. And she's doing this out of uh, kindness and compassion, but you can't live like that for too long as, uh, as a uh, monastic. You do need some help. So it's not just giving, donations are easy to give. You just write out a check or send it online, but actually just to give something much more than that, some physical help. And if you do give the physical help, please always remember to, um, if you promise something, to keep that promise. Don't just come, oh yeah, I'll help you. And then six months later disappear because those other things are more important. Just imagine what it must be like to be a bikuni in England, living alone, and just supporting all of this. It's easy for me, I just come here, log on, and just uh, start speaking. But actually making it all possible to happen, that's something totally different and heroic. So please, any of you can, who have skills, not talking about money, has skills, can actually just help with the newsletters, internet, Oh, there's so many other things, organizing things. So that's a wonderful thing to actually to offer. Offer your hands and your head, not your wallet. Um, since I am a bikini Ajahn, and I often speak about um, the bikini cause and why it's important oh, for yeah. us to have bikinis, it's easy for me to say that as a female, but why do you think that it's important that we do have female leaders and female monastics? What would your perspective be on that? There's so many perspectives. One out of many perspectives is uh, religion has taken a hammering in recent years because of uh, sexual uh, abuse, of not just of women by uh, senior monks or teachers or priests or something, but also um, just the abuse and so many other areas of life. You just look at the news and there's always some problem. Over here in uh, Australia, there's a high court judge has been abused of sexually abusing the people working with him. And that's gross. It's just so all over the place. And one of the solutions of that, and this is kids as well, kids have been just so ruined by just you know, trusting people, which children usually do, and having that trust you know, beaten out of them or raped out of them. And that is just so ter ter oh, was it terrible. And one of the solutions to that, which every psychologist, sociologist knows, is to have more women leaders. And if Buddhism is worth anything, we should have women leaders. And they've got women like you who are just willing to give a hand and help. You don't always need to have monks just running the show. And that's one of the reasons why I'm very happy that you're over there and just, you know, learning how to be a leader and growing in leadership. You can't do that if you're just like a, a 10 precept nun. So where's the other precepts? Why can't I have those precepts as well? The Buddha allowed you to have those precepts. There's nothing wrong with it. The venue allows you, and it's a great thing for Buddhism in our world, and that, that actually happens. And so I just, basically, I can't, can't stand it if women don't have that leadership. I think there's something wrong with Buddhism, or rather, not with Buddhism, but the way it's practiced in our world. Look at Thailand. Please excuse me, Sri Lanka, Burma. Still not really accepting sort of the leadership of women in Buddhism. And if we do that, we'd have far less abuse in our countries. And I'm now talking to a bhikkhuni in Britain. There's still abuse in Britain. There's still sort of elites and those who are disadvantaged. And 
believe it or not, that you're part of that solution. In fact, there's a bhikkhuni there. There's a leader. And please excuse me, but I think everybody would know, I don't always tell you what to do. In fact, I try not to tell you what to do. Because I want you to make your own mistakes. And grow out of those mistakes and learn and become a sort of a strong sort of uh, advocate to show people that women can do as best as men, probably even better. So surpass. You take me as your teacher. Please stand on the shoulders of the teacher and see further. Don't stand in my shadow. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay, and please help her do that. Yeah. <laughs> and just to reflect back to everybody here that it is the case that you've always nurtured whatever potential you can see in me and I feel yeah. there's always been an opportunity to make mistakes and know that I'm being held and know that I'm accepted yeah. and I have that space yeah. to grow so that's really yeah. empowering and I really take a lot of encouragement from that you know in how to lead yeah. effectively and I think most yeah. of us here you know who many of us will be considering you are a teacher i think one yeah. of the beautiful characteristics of a true teacher is the ability they have to put other people at ease and i think i've always felt respected safe and trusted in your presence yeah. which is very beautiful um and that allows us to grow so thank you on behalf of everybody here um there is somebody saying in the chat box that is it appropriate to consider you and the bswa sangha um their teacher and so I think many of us do consider that. And for me, yeah. you know, considering someone their teacher is a very personal thing and it really is a heartfelt connection. Yeah. So thank you but, for being here. But please always have many teachers, not just one. Remember like being in university, how many teachers did you have? If you see someone who's wise, can give you something which is really worthwhile, please value them as a teacher. You have one main teacher if you want, but have many other people who actually support. Um, I think Mel might want to say just a couple of words. It will take about a minute before we say goodbye to you also, Ajahn. Okay. So I'll just Take invite care. Mel to mention how you can support us. Thank you, Venerable, and thank you, Ajahn Brown. What a fabulous session. I'm sure I speak for everybody and a heartfelt thanks to you both. Um, I would just like to offer a few words on the Buddhist practice of dana, which many of you know means generosity in Pali. And dana refers to both the act of giving as well as the donation itself. The Buddha teaches that dana is very important, is a very important part of our spiritual path and serving as the foundation of our practice. So it can help us to really let go of some of our self-interest and cultivate a mind of joy, loving kindness and compassion. The Buddhist monastics practice generosity through sharing the Dharma, and this offers those who value this opportunity to practice uh, generos generosity by providing for their material needs. So if you do feel able to contribute, um, as well as with your time, as Arjun has requested, also your, your donations are deeply appreciated, and they will enable Venerable Chanda to continue spreading the Dharma uh, and inviting esteemed teachers for our pleasure and also to support the development of the first uh, Bikuni uh, Monastery in the UK, which is of course the wider aim of the project. So you can get more details about the project and how to donate online. I'll pop the links into the chat box and a big thank you to all of those generous people who've already donated via the Facebook Live page today. Much appreciated. Thank you. And again, thank you, Adrian Brown. It's been absolutely wonderful. Um, I think we're stuck on your video, Mel, but that's okay, if you don't mind. Okay. <laughs> so, um, wishing everybody very well. Thank you so much for turning up today. And again, you know, you're supporting us just by your very presence, especially during this um, Corona period. It's felt very beautiful to be able to offer sessions every week and to see the same people coming again and again. So I've really felt that there's a sense of community building up, which is very special. And... Uh, I hope that that will translate into some support on the ground. And of course, people are welcome to come and stay longer term with me once the Corona crisis uh, is more or less over. We don't know when that will be. And also to train, you know, towards ordination if anybody has that aspiration. And it can just start with a first visit. 
you know it's not something that you make a decision on overnight although sometimes the heart is very called to monastic life but it's a process and so I, I hope that what we're doing here can be part of that process for many people and can offer you the opportunity to have a little taste of monastic life yeah even for lay people it's very beautiful to live in a monastery as opposed to a retreat center because in a retreat center you might meditate very intensively but then what happens when you go outside you leave that environment behind and you go back into your ordinary life whereas in a monastery you have this opportunity and the conditions to immediately put into practice whatever you've learned on the cushion you know because you're surrounded by other people who have liberation as their goal so it can be very very supportive and integrating for the meditation practice to actually live in community with other spiritual friends so everybody's warmly welcome to stay in touch with us and of course to make the visit if you can also to make the visit to perth and support the monks and the nuns over there we actually have another nun here today i'm not sure if she's still here venerable pasana who is one of the nuns at damasara monastery i also hope that i'll be able to invite her to england someday so um that's enough for me, I think, and handing over to Ajahn Brown just for the last words. If there's anything you'd like to say as a final goodbye, Ajahn. Yeah, no, this is something which I got from an Indonesian disciple who said, please, can you finish off with some chanting? I'll do a little blessing for you all. <laughs> Saba Santa Pawajito Saba Vera Mati Gando Ibuto Chato Wagboa Sabiti O Viva Chantu Saba Logo Vina Satu Mate Bowan Thank <laughs> Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Very good. Teddy bear. Teddy bear. Very good. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Thank you, Ajahn, okay. so much. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Bye. Bye.